reports. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, Karen, you had said that um, there, there was quite an increase on residents outside the city, and I'm not finding those numbers. Or How do we know how much is being raised on rural <coughs> county instead of the city? And I think we might refer that to Mr. Gerber, to, um, if that's all right. Um, the source, source of all information. <laughs> Is your question what amount of revenue do we raise from out of the city or what the formula is <coughs> or both? Well, and the increases. I sh there was a comment yeah. that they were having quite an increase, and I know there was an editorial today but that it could be increased on the rural county, rural county residents rather than the city residents. Our out-of-city service is, and you have to distinguish between our wholesale, wholesale customers and our retail customers. Also, customers are governed by contracts, so that's those rates are locked in contractually. But and those are are those generally the rural water districts, I or not? Say generally, yes. Okay, which is that's I think that helps. We are more familiar the rural water districts we have contracts with. But for example, we have an industrial customer <coughs> outside of the city, um, and their rate is set at 175 percent of, I believe, the residential rate. Of the inside city for okay thank you uh, it's set at 175 percent of the inside city rate of whatever class they're in so in that particular case it's 175 percent of this inside the city residential rate and industrial the, rate and their increases will be the same as for within the city I think that was a question like how much are how much are their <coughs> rates increasing compared to those that were increasing in the city it, Mr. Mayor, it would be a proportional increase. And the final question, the rural water districts that we have contracts with, how often are those renewed and are what is the rate set at with those contracts? I don't know those contracts uh, off the top of my head, but I know we have some folks in the audience who could speak to those. Yeah, very quick. Mr. Mayor and, and Councilman Schwartz, I would feel a little uncomfortable uh, okay. We probably don't have all that information sitting here today. We can pull together. There are several contracts. They all have different starting and ending dates and terms. So uh, we will pre pre prepare and provide a report on that for you, for this body. Mm -hmm. Mayor? Yeah, Ms. Oh, Silver. This sheet, the ones that we got handed out at first, it's a single sheet. There was one for water, one for wastewater. The top half was local and the bottom half was outside the city on those doc sheets that we started with. So if you find those, you'll have them. <laughs> and they do go up substantially more. They start out higher than the, lo than the inside city rates and they increase more, higher than. If I may, Mr. Mayor, it, 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 it's an up proportional increase so if as an industrial customer in the city you pay 225 per thousand gallons the rate for an industrial customer outside of the city is 175 percent of that rate and it'll go up six percent next year in yes sense. both on the volume and the <coughs> meter charge right mayor, mayor an example of Silver. the an example of the difference would be that the single family residential rate inside the city is currently $3.58, or maybe ignoring this year because they're so different with the way it's calculated. For 2015, it's $3.79. For single family residential outside the city, is $6.65 per thousand gallons. And by 2017, in the staff proposal, the <coughs> single family residential inside the city is $4.18 per thousand gallons. And for outside the city is seven dollars and thirty three cents per thousand gallons. Pretty different. But of course, the, um, they could always choose to be annexed Absolutely. into the city and therefore not have to pay the um, one hundred and seventy five percent more. <coughs> Councilman Harmon. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, Doug, I want to take you back to this document that you handed out and discussed at the uh, outset of your remarks. <clears throat> I want to refer you to the, to the second column, the commercial. 
outside <coughs> the second box under commercial 2015 gallons. You have uh, examples for a $1,000, excuse me, 1,000 gallon consumer, <coughs> 415,000 gallon consumer, and a 4.150 gall million gallon consumer. <coughs> You look to the uh, to the meter charge. <clears throat> there are three meter charges listed. Uh, the first one is 9.83, which is I'm assuming a one inch or below meter. Uh, the second number for the 415,000 gallon usage is $62.90. I don't find that on the uh, the one below one inch, 1.5 inch, two inch, three inch, or four inch. So where did you come up with the $62.90? Is that a, a 3.5 inch? <laughs> I, I, I don't know. Mr. Harmon, those, those examples are based on actual customers that have different sized meters and different numbers of meters? And so, for example, in that particular case, it's based on a, a commercial customer that has a four inch and a six inch or something. That's not right, but it's, it's based on an actual example of a customer, if that makes sense. So it's based on their two meters added together to get that okay. meter charge, or their three meters or whatever the example is. <coughs> No, the same same rationale then on the the uh, the next meter charge is two hundred and thirty five dollars and eighty four cents. That's a combination of the <coughs> various meters that that particular customer has. Yes, that's the aggregate. I didn't show the math, but for example, on the four hundred and fifteen thousand gallon user, that is a user with two two inch meters. Oh, the four million gallon user, it's. Uh, or three inch meters. Okay, thank you, I appreciate that. I was afraid it would be more confusing if I showed those individually, so I just did the aggregate. <clears throat> That's fine. I think, and along with that information that I found interesting is that on the information it shows, we have 26 industrial accounts. However, we only have eight industries in that because they have many meters. Run that by me again. Our information where it shows how many <laughs> accounts at each of the levels, it states we have 26 at the industrial level. We have 26, and actually that's 26 meters for eight industries uh, because I think one industry has 13 meters. So that, you know, that's <laughs> as we get more down in the in the bushes, we keep finding out more of this information that it's hard to to um, be on top of. And it's just so many different things to look at. It It, it is a <coughs> challenge. Okay, we, we have a final opportunity <coughs> here. Councilwoman Schwartz. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, Doug, when we were talking and you were going over the um, rate increases, with individual council members in your office. I asked how much this was going to generate a year, the rate increases, and you said about $2 million a year. Is that still what these rate increases would generate? That's, that's correct, Councilwoman Schwartz. Um, both the proposal that the city staff has put forward and also uh, Councilman Brown's proposal generate approx in water approximately $2 million a year. Okay. Thank you. And wastewater, the increase would be wastewater is a little bit less than 2 million it varies by year it's 1.7 or 1.8 million so combined a little under 4 million between the two <laughs> and it's cumu cumul cumulative <laughs> in that it's 2 million a year so by the time you get to the end of water it's up 5 and whatever it is on mm -hmm. wastewater Last opportunity. Any other questions, concerns, issues, Councilman Harmon? I don't mean to be continually beating the proverbial dead horse here, but Doug, can you? And I don't expect an answer right now, but 
it appears that we have uh, meter sizes ranging from below one inch up to 10 inch. That's correct. Okay. How do those meter sizes fall across single family, multifamily, commercial, industrial, and irrigation? Is that something you can provide? I can tell you generally that the average residential customer has a meter that is uh, five eighths or less than an inch. So sing single family. Generally speaking, yes. There's exceptions to every rule, of course, but generally speaking, inside the city limits, we have, um, <coughs> you know, forty four thousand six hundred seventy one inch and below meters, and that approximately corresponds to single family and multifamily. Single family and multifamily. Is it? Is that what you said? Yes, those are, that's typically the size you'll see with, with those types of customers. Okay. And then with commercial, it, it really just depends on the type of operation. Some commercial operations are going to have a small meter size, you know, five-eighths or less than an inch meter. Some, you know, in the examples that I handed out tonight, will have four, three-inch meters or two, two-inch. It just it really varies by their particular need. So you can't, again, you can't say there's an average size for those types of accounts. Okay. Thank you. Just a, another interesting question along that line. Do we determine, is that pretty much a standard of, uh, is there code that we follow, uh, or is it up pretty much to that commercial, industrial entity, what size and how many meters they have? and. Uh, or that's something that's worked out between the department and the new construction process as city manager. Yeah, Your Honor, if I could just answer, generally it's based on need. Uh, that would be part of the engineering of the facility. There would be certain code issues in terms of all of that, but uh, generally when the project is brought forward, it follows the standard requirements based on the need of the facility. Okay, thank you. Any other questions anyone has? Coming down to an end on this discussion item, Councilman. I, I have just one more question. Um, what's the rate that we're currently replacing lines at, and with the with the current, I think it's the two million dollars a year that we have in the replacement program. How many lines are we replacing, and what's our capacity? if we were to increase um, funding to that program for, I mean, can we can we do 10 miles a year, or can we do two miles a year, or do we know? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Yeah, if you, uh, if you get that uh, question, I'd like, understand. Yeah, I'd like to ask Mr. Uh, Whitaker to address that in terms of the, the plan that we're bringing forward, what you're requesting, is what would our capacity for line replacement be under that budget? Right. And sort of asking, too, what size of lines do we typically replace? <coughs> I thought you, I heard that. That would be fine, too. <laughs> you want to answer that also? Mr. Mayor, <laughs> uh, Councilman Schmidt, I don't know as I have, you know, the exact. I'd have to get you, you know, because, yeah, there are various size lines out there that we're replacing. I think rule of thumb is, I think we said $6 million would replace roughly you know, seven to eight, you know, 100 feet of line, um, or excuse me, miles of line, I want to get the right terms. So that would be, you know, just a general, you know, from that, again, it would de depend. We've got, you know, 12 inch, eight inch lines up to, you know, 24 and larger. Uh, so it would vary depending on those, you know, that line size and, and also the conditions of installing the line, you know, how deep is it, et cetera, when we're replacing. Just to follow, that, I, and I I understand that it's kind of, I guess what I'm what I'm trying to get at is, you know, we obviously have a problem in this city with water lines breaking, and it's something that we, you know, want to address because it's going to save us a lot of money in the long run if we can if we can address that. And I'm I'm I guess I'm curious, you know, if we tried to go out and repave half of the city, the cost of contracting that out would would jump by. A lot because we don't have the capacity to do that. I'm, I'm kind of trying to get at, you know, what's a good rate, where we don't 
start shooting ourselves in the foot by, you know, not being able to contract this work out at a reasonable cost. Does that make sense? I'm, I, I'm not sure I'm following on the, on the question. If we if we were to give you ten million dollars a year to replace water lines, would you be able to do that, or would we be above the ability to replace at that rate, or a hundred million, or whatever? When we were looking at you know we were looking at the eight hundred and some miles that we have, and we were looking on a hundred year replacement, which would be eight miles a year, mm -hmm. so that's six to eight. Could we get up to you know if you gave us ten million dollars, we you know, we could probably handle that. Yeah, to go to 100 million, no, we'd have the whole city tore up and nobody would be able to move, uh, you know, from that standpoint. Plus, we would all probably overextend our contractors, kind of the same thing we found with road construction. Did we get too much in 13 going? We backed off some this year so that we didn't have as much tore up. So those would be, again, where those lines are, et cetera. But, you know, I see if that answers your question is I think, you know, in that six, if you gave us, you know, if we had $10 million, could we handle that much? I would say probably yes, you know, from that standpoint. But we but don't want, we, I don't, if we went more than that, if we were talking just line replacement, obviously yeah. other issues within the plants can be eight, nine, 10, you know, $12 million projects, and that would be a whole different ball game when you start, you know, talking repair to the plant. And that's kind of what I'm looking for is, is a, a target that we can, you know, so that we can do this as, as fast as we can, but as responsibly as we can, too. So thank you very much. Are there other questions or comments from anyone? Um, Mr. City Manager, would you want to um, you want to comment, close um, from, our, from our discussion this evening? Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I think we're comfortable with the information that we're getting, and we will bring back to you a recommendation <laughs> for uh, direction and uh, hopefully a favorable decision. Thank you. All right, that completes our discussion items, our non-action items this evening, and we proceed to announcements. Uh, first, uh, Mr. City Manager. Um, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I, d I don't have any items today. Okay. And I, we've had, we haven't met for a couple of weeks, but uh, there have been a number of significant openings in the city. A lot is going on, and I know many of you will be probably co commenting on those, but I want to just uh, say today uh, KDOT, Kansas Department of Transportation, had their cans consult for this area, region of the state. Um, there was a story in this morning uh, about the county and their proposal. Um, this is a, a, really, it's an important meeting because it provides uh, the cities, counties, whatever, if within this region to state their uh, priorities from the perspective of requesting uh, in work from the Kansas Department of Transportation. Uh, the, the city of Topeka had two major areas. One is the uh, Wanamaker Arvonia <laughs> uh, area where we are requesting a uh, study and also the possibility of a new uh, exit of the turnpike on the, between East Terminal and South Terminal that we have looked, talked about before. So just some long range plans. It's just very, uh, we're making a request, but it's a very long range before they will, uh, KDOT will look at all the different requests that are made and perhaps sometime in the future that we will hopeful that we will be receiving uh, some action on those. We turn to um, Councilwoman Ortiz. I just like to continue to thank people that have continually showed me love. Um, it's kind of been overwhelming with the cards and stuff, but um, you know, I was always taught to say thank you, so I wanted to continue to say that. Second, I wanted to say I am not a big K-State fan, but what the K-State family did for the uh, Harwood family was awesome. Um, those young men got to, um, and his brother got to eat with the football players, the coach, and do the t flipping of the coin. And I think that says a lot about not only our city, but our state. Um, and, and I think that was just very, very awesome. So I, I, I kind of at work, you know, I kind of said that to him at work, and I've had a little purple around my cube. Just, you know, I just think that's just really awesome. Those boys I read on Facebook, um, they went to bed with their footballs, and they have bragging rights, and they do have bragging rights, and I think that's awesome. 
Um, I too lost my father, and it's it's something that you don't get over very well, but are very fast. But it's something they'll they'll cherish forever. Even even the Royals and go Royals. <laughs> Uh, Billy Butler is one of my favorite players, believe it or not. He got a slide in there the other night. But anyway, um, even they got to go down there and um, they got to throw the first pitch out. And again, that just speaks volume to um, our city and our state and the people that have wrapped around, um, wrapped their loving arms around that family and that continue to. And I, I just want to say that I acknowledge that and I, I really think that's awesome when we can do that. Thank you, Mr. Miller. And let me add, at the um, suggestion of Councilman Harmon, we sent a letter on from the city to uh, Coach Snyder and to the athletic department at, at Kansas State, thanking them for the recognition they provided to the Harwood family. Debbie and Mary, Mrs. Elisla, Councilman Manspeaker, Councilwoman Schwartz. Real, real quick, the um, Apple Festival at Ward Mead was this past weekend, and thank you to all the volunteers that helped and also all the people that came out and hopefully um, if you didn't make it you'll put it on your calendar for next year and I went on the farm tour this past weekend and it was delightful um, I didn't make it out of the out of the county to the other farms but um, the Iwig Dairy is also holding a apple or an Oktoberfest um, I think on the 18th so if you haven't had an opportunity to go to our one of our farms to do that. And then I would be remiss if I didn't mention my neighbor, uh, Jeannie Schuler is um, uh, with the Mulvane Arts Center is having their big gala this coming weekend. Councilman Schmidt, Councilman Harmon, Ms. Tiller. Oh my gosh, there's been a lot going on. I'll zip through it, but uh, four of us went to Tulsa on the inner city trip and it was awesome. Uh, in there will be other highlights come out, I think, but in particular, the, the plans they have for development along their riverfront are phenomenal. But what was really cool about it to me was that they could very much break down into components. It's very manageable for anybody to put the kind of thought and creativity that they put into what's a pretty extensive riverfront project. Overall, the biggest thing that, that I got out of it was process. They had really engaged the citizens and the ideas and the development of Riverfront as an example, but other projects and their young professionals are apparently the biggest and most active and engaged young professional association in the country. And rather, they not only do get involved in learning about things and having social events, but they actually get each other on boards and ask everybody what's happening and what are they accomplishing. and. Um, have taken on civic issues themselves and it was just impressive to see how engaged everyone was. We did stop in at their makerspace as well and got a sense for how that's developing. Um, we had a visit from a gentleman with the League of American Bicyclists last week. He was coming through making stops in different cities. He was not really aware of that in that particular individual how far along we were and that we had applied and, and been awarded honorable mention status but we got very good feedback. There were about eight people that met with him and rode parts of the city. So it was exciting to get that sort of positive visibility and feedback. Uh, some of you have seen an announcement that I've put out. We, at this body, considered demolition on the East Topeka United Methodist Church uh, about a year ago. That's gone through some changes and some, and some efforts. Um, only to talk to the people that they already knew maybe would be interested in the church. Uh, on Saturday, the, the Faith and Fellowship folks did post a legal in CJ Online and in the print paper um, asking, offering the church for free for somebody to either move it or demolish it. So kind of last call. And if anybody knows of anybody, there has been some interest this week. It's out on History Geeks and in a variety of networks just to see if anybody would want to take it. The Historical Society would help with contacts with demolition folks as well as techniques for how to move it if somebody was able to do that. So I wanted to mention it here as well. Um, <coughs> Downtown Topeka Inc. had their annual, their gala, which was their 50th anniversary last night. They did a fabulous job, had the Regency Ballroom packed, and had as a speaker a 30-year-old gentleman that everybody that went to Fargo, which didn't include me, but met at that visit talking about what young people are doing and how Fargo 
a, a city very similar to us, has pulled itself around and is doing such fun things, much of which they're doing for nothing, which he kept pointing out. <laughs> Just people getting together and doing things, which is cool. Um, St. Francis uh, dedicated their emergency room this afternoon. And that's not only a, a, what, an $11 million investment, but also they stayed inside the city and are thriving there, having taken some time and modified their business plan. And it was really great to see all the support. Vallejo, these are all in District 1, but whatever, <laughs> it's been a busy week or two. Vallejo um, raised money and added an addition to Vallejo out on the west end of the Topeka State campus on Oakley. Uh, they call it, internally anyway, the residence. They found that they really needed a place where people who came in crisis could stay for a while, a couple of hours or maybe a couple of days. And they have 26 rooms, uh, 10 doubles and 6 singles, and a tremendous setup to support that part of the tremendous need in our community. So wanted to share those various things. And then the mayor mentioned the KDOT planning this morning. We had a tremendous turnout of city and county folks and some support from the chamber for that. So it was a good deal. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Mr. Brown. Uh, we have three persons who have uh, indicated interest in public comment tonight. The first is Martha Weber. Martha Weber here. <coughs> Okay, we will go <coughs> next. We have Cindy Green. I'm Cindy Green. I live at 4025 Southwest 28 Terrace. I'm one of the 13 houses involved in hoping to have this uh, work out so that a Walgreens could be put there and kind of clean up the community. I've been raised um, most of my life a mile from where I live, and I have watched it deteriorate seriously. Um, we do have an easement behind all those properties. I myself have tried to keep that, go behind those properties and get that cleaned out. Now rocks, trash, everything's thrown back there. We have weeds 10 feet high that I can't keep up as a person. Um, but with all the rentals, we don't seem to have anyone that really gets involved to help clean up this neighborhood. We have um, had some abandoned puppies left back there that we have rescued. Um, and we continue to try to clean it up. So I'm hoping that something will happen that this Walgreens thing will go through, kind of clean up this rental um, mess that has taken over that area. The inner part of the circle, it, we really have no problem. But with the children, I, I will be moving one way or another um, to raise my children where there's not police. Um, you know, we're always having police coming around, and, you know, they're frightened. The children have been um, foster children that I have adopted, and that neighborhood has just gone downhill. So um, I just wanted to encourage you to seriously think of um, that vote next week to clean up that corner. The rest of the area is pretty pretty nice area to live in. The school is not far from there. And it would be a great thing to clean up that corner. So I would appreciate any positiveness you. you can see in that. Thank you. Week. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Green. And the city manager, I believe this is on the agenda for next week. We'll be he hearing um, the first, um, the introduction of that. And I, it has been pointed out uh, on the information we had, it's uh, Marshall Weber. Marshall Weber here. Okay, Marshall Barber. Yeah, I'm here to speak uh, in support <clears throat> of a project that you'll be considering next week, uh, the same project that she was talking about, and to uh, actually provide some further uh, verification regarding her comments regarding the state of that corner. I went over there this morning and <clears throat> took some colored <laughs> photographs of the structures that are presently on that corner um, and are disseminating those for the good of the order. 
And I'm here to uh, speak both as a Topeka citizen who's lived here for a really long time and I'm uh, always concerned with what's going on in our city. And I'm also speaking as a real estate agent who works. Most of my business is actually in the city of Topeka as opposed to all the, the glamorous McMansions on the uh, <laughs> outskirts of town. And I'm, I'm very interested in promoting continued development within the city. And I'm, I'm supporting this project, and I would ask you all to support it for a number of reasons as follows. First of all, I believe that the overall mental and emotional well-being of the community will benefit from the presence of a new brightly lit commercial structure in one of the more uh, established, older portions of town. And uh, it is on the near west side. We do have, uh, <clears throat> in that area, a, a lot of aging structures that are not being particularly well maintained, uh, both commercial and residential. And this would represent a good turnabout from that. Um, the Planning Commission uh, recently was in the newspaper <coughs> as also expressing an interest in as much new development within the city limits as possible, bringing in new housing and so forth. And uh, this would be uh, consistent with those objectives. The project will, in, will improve the neighborhood residential and commercial values by removing the unsightly structures, which have been uh, caught up for several years in, in kind of a death spiral of declining tenant quality. The traffic on the corner makes it more difficult to attract good tenants in the first place. And so the landlords, it's, it's really not a, a comment on a lot of these landlords, but they find it uneconomic really to continue to invest in these properties. And, and so the spiral continues from there. Um, there's a friend of mine who lives over there. And she was telling me that quite recently they had a big disturbance out on Gage Boulevard fairly typical of what goes on out there at 1.30 in the morning, people screaming incoherently, um, lots of obscene epithets being hurled about, and uh, two 911 calls were, were needed to, uh, to get the situation addressed. And <clears throat> it's, it's really clear to me that given the declining residential nature of that corner and the impact it's having on, on other people in the area, that <clears throat> the highest and best use for this corner is, is no longer single family residential, that it's actually commercial. And if you look at 29th and Wanamaker, 29th and Fairlawn, 21st and Fairlawn, 21st and Wanamaker, all four of those corners all have commercial structures on them. And it's interesting to note that all of the neighborhoods in those areas are actually neighborhoods with where the homes have, have either maintain their values or are actually going up in value. Uh, the argument that this project may negatively affect values in the neighborhood I think is addressed and negated by the photos that I'm giving you okay, your show that what's already there. Okay, your time is up. I do you want that. to clean or <laughs> do we need additional time? One more sentence. One more sentence will That's allow. Uh, the, uh, the only uh, thing I'd have to add to that is that uh, the Planning Commission has already unanimously approved this project and hopefully you will too. Okay, thank you. <laughs> thank you for your consideration. Thank you for your comments. We appreciate <coughs> that. Now, uh, council members, we have an executive session. If uh, Ms. Faney would uh, state, uh, if Ms. Faney, if you would state the parameters for the uh, executive session. If, if someone would move to recess into executive session for 10 minutes to discuss matters relating to employer-employee negotiations relative to the upcoming IAFF negotiations, and in order to assist the governing body, the body would request that the city manager, Mr. Gerber, and the deputy city attorney, myself, be present. Someone could make that motion. Okay, Ms. Della Isla moves and Mr. Schmidt seconds. Any discussion? All those in favor vote yes. Opposed vote no. And this would be for 10 oh, minutes. Sorry, that's correct. Sorry, 10, 10 minutes. 10 minutes. I missed that. I think she did say that. Um, nine having voted yes. I'm sorry. Now we have nine having voted yes. 
Uh, we will go into executive session when the hall is clear. The executive session it has been completed with no action taken. Uh, there is one item that we do want to complete, and that is a review of the agenda for next week's session, if the clerk would review for us. Okay, for next week, on the October 14th council agenda, we will have a presentation for the 2015 legislative agenda. For the action items, we will have four zoning cases. The first one will be the new Walgreens at Southwest 29th Street and Gage Boulevard. Then the second is in the 100 block of Northeast Lime Street. The third one is at 844 Northeast Quincy Street. And then we will have, um, the, the fourth will be in the 800 block of Northeast Monroe. And then we have the ordinance for the utility rates. Thank you. There being no other business, the meeting is adjourned. And the, uh, second and the how the stormwater utility was doing and the answer was we're still watching that we really don't want to raise those rates um, we do have the levy however coming up we need 4.1 million for that if we could protect the overall rates as well as the specific utility rates I'd like to see us do that so my last two have to do with that one would be contacting the county and asking the county if they are at a point where they could consider rolling back the recycling rate on refuse. As we all know, that's stacked into that bill. So when people's bill go up, go, bills go up, they, they look to us. But that county rate went up $4 a month. And when they first were talking about doing recycling, they talked about not raising rates at all. Then they talked about raising it just on the folks who didn't use the recycling, but having it be no rate increase for the people that did. Ultimately, they decided to just do the $4 overall. I'd like to see us inquire how they're doing with that fund and whether there's a possibility to roll it back. Again, in this plan, we're not raising anybody more than about a dollar to $2 a month. If that refuse rate could roll back correspondingly, it would help our citizens. And last, even though stormwater isn't part of this rate increase, it's right out there on the horizon, and if we could minimize that, I would like to do that. My last suggestion would be that we again visit with the county in terms of a mutual agreement about how to use the remainder of the current countywide half cent sales tax. There is expected to be at least six million, maybe more, if we took, if they were willing to agree and we could commit 1.9 million of that for the weir improvements that we're looking at on the river for safety on that weir and the other 4.1 for the other half of the levy match money that we need to come up with so we don't have to accumulate it or borrow it. I think it would help secure that stormwater for our rate payers. Thank you, and I do have that in writing so that people can see it. Council members, why don't we break from our discussion and have our uh, public comments uh, right now. And the first piece of person to speak is Teresa Miller. Good evening again. Thank you. I'm Teresa Miller, North Topeka West NIA, but I'm here also as just in person, I am living on a fixed income. Uh, everybody in my house is on a fixed income. Uh, so that kind of scares me when it increases. But let me tell you, the presentation that you all received tonight is not the presentation that the public got at the meetings. This has been buffered in 100% better. 
Because when I looked at certain areas of this, when you did the rate increases, it didn't say three dollars and some odd cents per thousand gallons. There was no thousand gallons up there. I was freaking out from the fifteen dollars that you were taking away, and then we had fifteen hundred gallons, and then you went to we're going to pay this nine dollars and eighty three cents a month with zero gallons, and I'm I'm like freaking out. It didn't say three dollars and something per thousand gallons on it. So I'm, in my head, I'm like, 